When is it okay for governments to spy on their own citizens? In June, news leaked of the National Security Agency's massive programs of cell phone and internet surveillance on the communications of American citizens. Is this type of collected all surveillance a violation of the right to privacy or justified in this post 9-11 era? Joining us now on that, Ron Diebert. He's director at the Canada Center for Global Security Studies and the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. And Ron, it's good to have you back in the studio. Glad to be here. Well, as we suggested, this story's a few months old already, and for those who may need a little refresher on what it's all about, what's the concern? Well, first of all, it's a story that never dies. Snowden has only released approximately 5 10% of the documents. This is Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, the, the NSA whistleblower who used to work for our contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, <clears throat> before some would fleeing, object to the term whistleblower. They would, yeah. That's certainly a subject for debate. Right. Uh, before he fled the United States, first to Hong Kong and then to Russia, he took with him several laptops uh, loaded with top secret documents that exposed uh, a lot of details about the National Security Agency's surveillance. Uh, the primary concerns, I think, for most Americans were about the collection, the mass surveillance of domestic communications. Uh, one of the first, in fact, the first of the of the uh, Guardian newspaper stories was about an order to Verizon, one of the telecommunications companies in the United States, to collect all metadata of American communications. Metadata meaning? Metadata meaning essentially the not the content of the call, so if we're having a conversation, um, uh, not, not what we're saying, but the length of the call, the address of the call, in other words, my number, your number, uh, if we're using cell phones, the geolocation of the call, um, it's interesting that you bring up metadata because uh, later President Obama coyly said no one is listening in on your phone calls under this program. That may or may not be true, but they're certainly collecting all of the uh, accompanying metadata, which uh, I believe, in fact, is actually much more valuable when it comes to uh, targeted surveillance. How? Well, uh, when you look at, look at it from an intelligence point of view, all of the conversations that are going on can obtain... Uh, include oblique references and maybe code words or euphemisms, but the metadata contains a lot of very precise information that can actually be used to uh, understand very precisely not only a person's location, but to whom they're speaking, at what time, uh, and that can allow you to ma map entire social networks. So it's a lot more powerful from an intelligence point of view and uh, a lot more invasive from a privacy point of view as well. Do we know the metadata that was collected, how specific and or general the targets were? Well, uh, I think as general is the answer because as we've learned uh, uh, the, the rule of thumb here, uh, and I think it's not just the rule of thumb that we learned about from Edward Snowden, it goes back really to 9-11 and, and the sea change that happened in the NSA's operations around that time to essentially collect everything, to collect as much as possible uh, as a starting point and then put it in a big data bucket somewhere uh, so that it can be analyzed later. Um, this is a, a, a really quite an astonishing change in the operational approach of the National Security Agency that I think has huge implications because we, as members of electronic society, have gone through a, a transformation in how we communicate how we network within the same period of time, essentially turning our digital lives inside out. We leave bits and traces of ourselves everywhere we go today through mobile phones, social networking, our use of cloud computing. So these two things are happening simultaneously. Do we assume that the NSA was picking up on this metadata of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? Tens of billions? You have, to, you have to assume that there are millions of conversations and transactions going on, uh, and that's just one company. Uh, of course, uh, other companies uh, have been compelled to do the same thing. Uh, on the very same day that the Verizon revelations came out, we learned also about another program called PRISM, in which uh, major internet companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, others uh, were also compelled to turn over uh, information about emails, uh, searches, and so on direct to the NSA. Um, so it's, it's a lot of transactions, which is in part why we know now why the NSA was also building a massive data processing facility in Utah, 
we're talking about a lot of information that ultimately has to go somewhere uh, that is then processed and ultimately analyzed and disseminated. You say the NSA compelled these organizations to turn over that information. Compelled yeah. uh, how and under upon law. what pen punishment? Well, under law, and, and this again, it goes back to 9-11 to uh, specific provisions. Uh, first, within the Patriot Act, uh, Section 215, uh, which requires uh, uh, or allows uh, law enforcement intelligence to access what is called in law any tangible thing related to uh, an intelligence or a foreign threat and, um, and also requires, compels the, those who are receiving that, uh, that letter not to speak about it under penalty of law. So there's essentially a gag order around it, which is why when the PRISM revelations came out, many of the companies denied actually participating in it. Um, so it's, it's under law in the United States. Thank you for setting the table. We're now going to invite three others to join the conversation and debate the uh, relevance of all of what we've been talking about here. So joining us now in New York, New York, Jamil Jaffer. He is Deputy Legal Director of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. In Washington, D.C., Joshua Faust. He's a freelance journalist and former fellow at the American Security Project. And in our nation's capital, Wesley Wark, professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. And it's good to have you three join our conversation as well. Uh, Jamil, let's uh, get you started on this one. Uh, I want everybody first off to give us um, your take on how concerning uh, the revelations about the NSA program are as far as you're concerned. Well, I mean, I think they're, they're deeply concerning. It's, a, it, it's an immense amount of information that the government is collecting. It, it, it's, it's very sensitive information. Even this metadata um, is, is extremely sensitive. There's a lot, there's a lot that the government can deduce uh, from information about who you called and when you called them. Uh, and obviously, that's why the government wants the information, but it's also why there ought to be safeguards. Um, preventing the government from needlessly intruding on the privacy of innocent people. And right now, those safeguards don't exist at all. Instead, what the government is doing is essentially collecting everything uh, about everybody uh, under only the weakest limits set by a court in secret. Uh, and nobody knew about uh, these programs at all uh, uh, before they were released by, before the, this information was released by, by Edward Snowden. So I think that there's a lot to be concerned about here, both in the scope of the programs uh, in the absence of meaningful safeguards for privacy uh, and in the, the secrecy that surrounded all of this. Joshua Faust, how concerned do you think we should be about these revelations? I think concern is completely warranted. Uh, learning that the government collects information on the scale is definitely worrying. Uh, I think uh, Jamil downplays the safeguard side of it somewhat in the subsequent leaks that we've had since details about both PRISM and this metadata collection program have come to light, uh, the government's error rate in obeying its own regulations that limit its collection on American citizens has actually proven to be, I think, very, very small. Less than a millionth of a percent of the queries that they've uh, done against their own databases have pulled up improper information. This doesn't apply, however, to people outside of the country. And I think globally, the concern about how much information the American government is collecting is perfectly justified. The problem they run into is that as an intelligence agency dedicated to collecting foreign intelligence, it's going to do that. It's legally created to do this. Within the United States, though, the debate about how much they're actually allowed to collect, I think, is bumped up against a certain ahistorical uh, mindset that ignores both what happened after September 11th when the entire intelligence community was mobilized and ordered to collect additional amounts of information and also going back into history the NSA is not uh, uh, not shy about collecting a huge amount of information about a huge number of people going back into the 70s programs like Echelon we're already collecting much of the information over the internet and almost every telephone communication around the world. And this was 20 years ago with technology that was 20 years old. So we can assume that everything that they're doing is at a higher scale. It's also not new. And pretending that, that there's something new in a spy agency essentially spying, I think, is really missing what's truly concerning about this, which is the lack of transparency about both oversight and how accountable they're held when they do either violate the law or make mistakes. More on that in just a bit. Wesley Wark, let me get your view on this insofar as when the story broke, President Obama said that these programs were, quote, a critical tool in protecting the nation from terrorist threats to the United States. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah. 
Uh, it's hard to know exactly how critical the tool, and, and I think the, um, uh, the way in which this question was raised may have led people to, to assume that what President Obama was talking about was that there were X number of cases in which uh, NSA intelligence alone you know, cracked open a terrorism offense. In reality, signals intelligence, which is, as Joshua has reminded us, has been around for a very long time, is one of a number of important intelligence tools. And for a long time, it's been a, a premier intelligence tool. Its, its history goes back, in fact, to, to the days before the First World War. It's been around a long time, and it's been a, it's been a major intelligence tool. I think the way we have to understand it is we, we may not know the precise details of how signals intelligence, uh, the kind of work that NSA does, contributes to individual cases uh, under investigation. But overall, it's a very important part of a kind of intelligence picture uh, that a government like the United States or indeed Canada tries to put together. And of course, this isn't just an American story. There's, there's a very interesting and intriguing Canadian and international dimension to, to what we've learned about the American program itself. Ron, why don't you follow up on that part of it? Well, I, it's very interesting comments. I agree with most uh, everything that's been said here. I, I do think there has been something new about, about what's going on here within the last decade. Keep in mind that uh, the NSA has been around since 1952, and as Wesley quite rightly points out, signals intelligence goes back a long time. During the Cold War, the signals intelligence agencies of the United States and other countries were mostly focused on each other in a kind of spy versus spy game. 9-11 really changed all of that. The, t the threat became more dispersed to society as a whole, and they began to turn their lens inward on all of us. And that is a, a, a fundamental sea change that hasn't sparked the type of almost like a constitutional conversation that we have about the relationship between secretive intelligence agencies that gather communications, all of our private communications, in the context of a society where we use these digital technologies and they are around us, they permeate everything that we do. That's, those two changes, I think, are fundamentally different for the age that we live in. Wesley, let me okay. do a follow-up with you on the angle that Joshua brought up a second ago, namely that of safeguards. If we've had a problem yeah. in literally one one millionth of one percent of the spying that goes on, is that something we should, live, I guess, be able to live with? Well, I think there are two kinds of concerns. One is, and it's, it's, it was sort of referenced by, by Ron, um, the world of communications is changing very, very rapidly. We're all aware of this, and intelligence agencies try and keep up. Um, and uh, so there's always, given that those changes in communications and, and, the, and the race to, to stay, up, stay up with them by intelligence services like signals intelligence agencies, you never really know where you are in terms of, of controls and safeguards from moment to moment. You want to have very robust ones. And I think um, you know, the truth is that the American system uh, has long recognized, it's not just a post 9-11 phenomenon, it's long recognized that once you're uh, in a major way into the business of intercepting communications, it's, it's really a borderless world and has been a borderless world for a long time. And, and the NSA has operated under uh, safeguards since, in fact, the late 1970s uh, in terms of the creation of this special court called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and um, authorizations from, and, and you know, representations to Congress about what NSA has been doing. Um, I think people have felt in the wake of the Snowden revelations that these 1970s era mechanisms for controlling what the NSA was doing were not sufficient. They really hadn't kept the public in the know sufficiently. There were concerns and some degree of skepticism about how well the secretive court was operating. Was it, you know, was it too kind of placid in the face of some of the new challenges? There were questions about how well Congress was exercising its oversight responsibility. And I, I think quite usefully, a greater demand, which President Obama and the American administration has tried to agree to, to meet, uh, unlike many countries around the world, including ours, uh, a demand for greater public knowledge about what exactly is going on and, and the extent to which um, you know, citizens in different countries can rest assured that there aren't gross abuses in terms of surveillance of either foreign uh, individuals or, or uh, their connections to domestic citizens. Greater transparency, yes, but let me just read an excerpt of something that Joel Brenner, who's the former Inspector General of the NSA, wrote last month. He wrote, the world now has extraordinary access to the details of how the United States operates and funds its intelligence agencies. This will lead to no good. It makes friendly countries nervous about what we can do and unfriendly countries happy about what we can't do. This kind of information also tells our adversaries about the structure and focus of our efforts 
including by implication the approximate number of agents we're training. We have committees of Congress who receive these details. That's how a representative democracy works. Putting the information out for general consumption is not in the public's interest if the public is serious about wanting a robust foreign intelligence capability, which is now an open question. You cannot run intelligence by plebiscite. Joshua, has Mr. Brennan, um, um, I think, has he put his finger on something insofar as the revelations here are jeopardizing the effectiveness of the NSA's surveillance operations? I think what Brennan is doing is highlighting this inherent tension built into democratic systems between how you can actually run an effective intelligence service while also maintaining some form of accountability and oversight and to a degree transparency. Um, that tension, I think, is something that doesn't get enough uh, attention in this entire debate. It is impossible. He's right that it is impossible for the NSA to be an effective organization if the details of its budget, of its resource allocations, of its personnel allocations, and its programmatic activities are printed on the Internet the way that they have been the last several months. And if this continues, then the NSA is actually going to be really challenged in continuing its activities abroad. I remember recently one of the stories that, that came out detailed which cities house servers that run NSA programs. That's an incredibly sensitive kind of information that doesn't actually relate to whether or not its programs are being abused or whether they're being used to harass innocent people. It's just a disclosure that happens to damage the NSA while not substantially adding to the public's understanding of or trust in or distrust of the program. So in that sense, I think he's right. But fundamentally, this, this tension is something that I think we're all kind of talking about and, and not really getting into very much which is whether or not the NSA is actually doing something effective, which I don't think we have much data to be able to say one way or another from the public, and whether or not they should be able to do a lot of these, these programs that they do. And that's something that the public itself hasn't grappled with either, along with the fact that the NSA is not the only agency, the only government agency out monitoring phone calls and internet traffic. The FBI has an enormous system set in place to both infiltrate networks, disrupt networks, monitor emails, they can also summon people to court, some of them into investigations in secret, while swearing them to silence about the entire process. We've heard recently about how the Drug Enforcement Agency can collect telephone records going back 20 years, which is something the NSA currently cannot do on American citizens. So there are a number of different federal agencies in a bunch of different directions who have developed similar capabilities and focusing only on the NSA, where their legal focus is supposed to be outside the country, I think is kind of missing the forest for the trees in a way. Ron, you cannot run intelligence by plebiscite. You agree? Well, I'd say you can't run a liberal democracy if mass surveillance is the rule, not the exception, and especially without proper checks and balances and safeguard. That would be my main reply. But just to pick up on something that was said earlier about the tension, there is definitely a tension between national security agencies' missions and domestic politics, but there's also an international tension that's worth bringing up here. Keep in mind that the United States has an enormous home field advantage by nature of the fact that the vast majority of the telecommunications infrastructure of the planet is American owned and operated. Eight of 14 tier one telecommunication companies are American companies. They're uh, required to follow American laws. Um, most of us who are non-Americans use American services like Google, Gmail, Google Docs, Gchat. Uh, we use Yahoo, Skype, Microsoft products. All of these are subject to U.S. laws and to U.S. surveillance. I think one of the biggest impacts of the revelations will be the international repercussions of all of this. Many people knew about it already, but I think policymakers outside of the United States will use these re revelations as an excuse to do what some of them are doing already, tightening their own national controls and further balkanizing the Internet. So it works very much against the U.S.'s own foreign policy around the Internet freedom. Hmm. Uh, Wesley Work, your turn on this one. The NSA leaker, Edward Snowden, said in an interview with Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian, quote, the consent of the governed is not consent if it's not informed. Somehow, though, we've got to find that sweet spot between informed consent and transparency and national security. How well are we doing at finding that sweet spot? Uh, Steve, it's a very important question. First, let me put it in a bit of historical context by saying something that I think is true, at least, which is that, that no country in any period of time uh, from the 20th century and the birth of modern intelligence down to the present has ever found that sweet spot. It's, it's a, a vast democratic work in progress. 
And to go back to the quote that you mentioned from the NSA Inspector General, the problem with finding this sweet spot is A, it, it may not exist, uh, and B, that when we talk about it, we tend to paint a picture of, of black and white. There is a public need to know and a public right to know about intelligence activities, which intelligence agencies them themselves tend not to see, respect, or understand. On the other hand, there's a, a, a valid requirement on the part of intelligence services to keep what are often called sources and methods safe uh, in order for them to do their work and to prevent endangering those sources uh, and methods. Uh, and it's an ongoing discussion we've had. It tends to be scandal driven, which is, I think, one of the problems, rather than uh, part of the sort of common discourse. When it's scandal driven, it tend, tends to be painted in, in extremes. But I, I would say that, that whatever Ed, Edward Snowden's um, uh, actual motivations might be and however we want to paint him, he's done both a service and a disservice. I think he's done a disservice probably to uh, national security interests of the United States and its allies. He's done a service to the American public and the global citizenry in pointing out the nature of some of these programs and allowing us to have a debate uh, about them. I, I think ultimately that sweet spot can be approached. I don't think we're uh, there yet in uh, either in the United States or in any other country that I know about. I would say, though, and this may surprise our American guests on this program, the United States is well ahead of us in finding this sweet spot uh, compared to Canada, certainly, where we've had hardly any debate about this, or even uh, you know, long-term allies with lots of intelligence experience that operate democracies like Britain or France or Germany. Well, let me get Jamil Jaffer on that one, because uh, even though you work for the American Civil Liberties Union, you're a Canuck. You're from here originally, so I'd be interested in your take on uh, who, which country is doing better at finding the sweet spot on this one? Well, you know, I, I, can, I can say that the United States certainly hasn't found it. Um, you know, we are having a debate now about government surveillance in the United States, obviously. We're having that debate because Edward Snowden leaked all of this material. We wouldn't be having it otherwise. Um, I, I think that, that, that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously true that, that you have to find a kind of balance here between the secrecy that's necessary to, to, to protect legitimate sources and methods, uh, and on the other hand, the transparency that's necessary to have a working democratic process. Um, what we've had here, though, for the last decade is so much secrecy around national security policy that the public really doesn't even have the opportunity to consent uh, to these very controversial policies, like it was true of torture, it was true of rendition, it was true of the original warrantless wiretapping program, and it's true of all of these programs that have been disclosed over the last few months. But what the government is doing through, for example, the call records program is collecting information about every single phone call made by uh, anyone inside the United States. You know, when, when did you make the call? Who did you talk to? How long did you talk? Uh, and ultimately, that, that's, that's extremely sensitive information. And, and maybe there is a good argument. I don't think so. But maybe there is a good argument uh, that national security requires it, uh, that unless the government is permitted to collect that kind of information, uh, the sky is going to fall in some, uh, you know, in some way. Uh, maybe there is a good argument. But the government has never had to lay that argument out. It's never had to defend the, these policies to anyone. Uh, not even Congress, because, um, because the information is compartmentalized even within Congress. Only, uh, only a handful of, of, of intelligence committee members had full access to all, to all of this information. Uh, other members were given the opportunity to see little pieces of it in closed sessions where they weren't even allowed to take notes, let alone take staffers. Uh, so, so you really don't have anything like a democratic debate, not even a democratic debate within Congress. Uh, and, and I don't think that in a democracy you can justify the, the implementation of policies on this scale uh, that aren't based on anything, uh, anything even remotely looking like, like public consent. Well, Jamil, so, while you um, have the floor... I guess I can say that the U.S. hasn't found the sweet spot. I don't know if Canada has. While you have the floor, I want to read you something that Hendrik Hertzberg had in The New Yorker back in June, and then I'll get you first to comment on this, because I think he takes issue with you. He said... From what we know so far about these NSA programs, and that is a caveat that should condition virtually every statement and judgment about them, including those you are now reading, they have been conducted lawfully. The threat that they pose to civil liberties, such as it is, is abstract, conjectural, unspecified. In the roughly seven years the programs have been in place, in roughly their present form, no citizen's freedom of speech, 
expression or association has been abridged by them in any identifiable way. No political critic of the administration has been harassed or blackmailed as a consequence of them. They have not put the lives of tens of millions of Americans under, quote, surveillance, as that word is commonly understood. Okay, Jamil, that's Henrik Hertzberg in The New Yorker. Well, do, you, do you disagree with him? Yeah. I, I, yes, I, I disagree with him strongly. I mean, I think it's the wrong way to look at all of this. Um, you know, if, if there are laws that authorize the government to collect everything, as there now are, uh, then it's no surprise that the government doesn't have to violate the laws in order to collect everything. So I don't, I don't think that it makes sense to look at the error rate, for example, to see how often the government has violated the laws. The problem is the law itself. The problem is the law that, that, um, that the government has interpreted to allow it to collect information about uh, everybody in the United States, whether they are suspected of, uh, of engagement in, in, in criminal activity or not. So you have these broad surveillance programs that sweep up all of this sensitive information about innocent people. And people like Hendrik Hertzberg, and I, I believe that Josh said this earlier on this, uh, in, in this conversation, uh, measure, uh, measure the, 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 the programs by evaluating the, the extent to which or the number of times the government has violated the restrictions on them. But the restrictions on them are so loose in the first place that, that uh, it's very rare that the government has to violate any restriction in order to invade pot privacy. It can collect all of this information uh, within the four corners of the law. Now, uh, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a simplification. The, the government is relying on Section 215, for example, of the Patriot Act to justify this call records program. Uh, but even the, the, the members of Congress who are uh, usually credited with having written Section 215 say that this program goes far beyond uh, what they contemplated when they wrote that provision. Uh, and in fact, just today, uh, a group of, of members of Congress uh, filed a brief in support of, a legal brief in support of our constitutional challenge uh, to the government's call records program. Uh, and the brief argues that, that the, the provision that the government is relying on, uh, a provision that these legislators wrote, was never intended to allow surveillance on this scale. So I think that you know, even if you are a person who believes that the only way to, uh, the only relevant question is whether the government has violated the law, uh, even if you're a, a person with that view, the legislators who wrote the, the provisions believe that the government has violated the law. Joshua, let me follow up with you, because if Hertzberg is right, and you can't actually put your finger on any violation that has taken place so far, is the potential for the type of harm that Jamil Jaffer has just described, is that there? Well, yeah, there's always potential for harm. I actually think the ACLU is correct to be constitutionally challenging it. I think laws should be challenged routinely in court, and, and that's how we establish the, their legitimacy. But one thing that I do have a problem with is saying that reviewing things before relevant committees in Congress doesn't constitute democratic review. That's how our system is designed to work. Those congressmen in the House and Senate Intelligence Committees were briefed on this program. They supported it. When, when Jamil said that the American people never had a chance to vote on this about things like torture and about wiretapping, President Bush got elected after Abu Ghraib got exposed as torturing. The members of Congress who voted to retroactively immunize telecommunications companies that engaged in warrantless wiretapping against American citizens got reelected after doing this. So the American citizens have seen their legislature do this publicly, write the Patriot, write the Patriot Act, extend the Patriot Act, write the FISA Amendments Act that actually created a warrant system by which the NSA could collect these phone records, and they still voted for them. So if that's not good enough, I mean, that's fine. But then we're talking about something else. We're talking about a failure of the American democratic system itself. That may be what they're arguing, but to pretend like this isn't how our system is designed to work, where the representatives that Americans elect to Congress are the ones who enact and then perform oversight against the administration, if that's not good enough, then, I mean, we're, we're talking about something very different than just surveillance. We're talking about a failure of the system itself, and I don't think that's what this is. Missing in a lot of this conversation is the fact that Congress actually has done its job. One of the revelations that came out uh, recently about the NSA is that when they created a program that overstepped the bounds of the law, the FISA, uh, 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 the FISA court, the, federal, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, actually told them it was unconstitutional and required them to disband the program. So these oversight mechanisms actually are effective and they actually do work. 
But if that's not good enough, then we need to have a much bigger discussion mm -hmm. about how the American system itself works. Okay, let's in our last five minutes or so here, let me come at this from a completely different angle. I'm going to read you, Ron, a piece here, or a little excerpt of a piece that Jill Lepore did in The New Yorker back in June. And it's from a different angle. One aspect of this story, she writes, that Congress is unlikely to concern itself with is the relationship in the 21st century between privacy and publicity. In the 20th century, the golden age of public relations, publicity, meaning the attention of the press, came to be something that many private citizens sought out and even paid for. This has led, in our own time, to the paradox of an American culture obsessed at once with being seen and with being hidden. A world in which the only thing more cherished than privacy is publicity. In this world, we chronicle our lives on Facebook while demanding the latest and best form of privacy protection, ciphers of numbers and letters, so that no one can violate the selves we have so entirely contrived to expose. Do we need to redefine what privacy means in the 21st century? Yeah, I, I would say so. I, th I think that, generally speaking, most people walk through their lives uh, sending emails, sending tweets, without uh, a full comprehensive understanding about what goes on beneath the surface of all of this. And that's a, an enormous sea change in our digital habits that I think has, has not caught up with people's understanding about what they're giving away. Not just when you send information explicitly. The metadata is such a good example precisely because there's so much information that we give away without actually knowing we're giving it away uh, around the envelopes. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, as compelling as the privacy arguments are around the NSA uh, disclosures, uh, for me, it's, it's not so much about privacy as it is about uh, protection against abuse of power. And I think in this regard, it's instructive for everyone to go back and take a look at the church committee hearings, uh, which were held in the 1970s after the Watergate scandal, after the Nixon administration scandal. This was a senator named Church. You're not referring Frank to... Frank Church was yes. the chairman of the committee mm -hmm. uh, in the United States Senate uh, that looked into precisely the same type of abuses that we're talking about then. In fact, one of the consequences of the Church Committee was to shut down Project Shamrock, which is a code name uh, for the NSA's collusion with telegraphic and telecommunications companies that were handing over information to the NSA, very similar to what's going on today. At the end of that committee, uh, one of the most poignant things Frank Church said was that these powers are, are profound and they can be turned on the American people uh, at a moment's notice. And it's that type of abuse of power that I think we have to concern ourselves with. Privacy is changing fundamentally. It's a whole other conversation. It's the potential for abuse of power when it's left unchecked that I think we have to concern ourselves with. No, fair with. enough, but let me touch a little bit more on that part of the conversation. Wesley, I'll go to you in Ottawa. I mean, do you, do you see a bit of an irony in that some of the information we willingly give up to higher authorities, either by using Facebook or by being on Google, is potentially far more personal and invasive than some of the stuff that the NSA appears to be spying? Do you see that? I do, and that's perhaps just because I'm an old guy, Steve. And 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 you know the the um, the notion in this debate over, over privacy is is that privacy is only concerned for certain generations, certainly not the current one, which which I think is wrong. What I what I would say about this is that that obviously as as part of all the changes that are going on in people's lives around communications, access to information, uh, use of electronic communications, uh, and the internet. Uh, one of the things, paradoxically, um, where the, this big security debate about the NSA and other aspects of both global and national security might actually have an impact is that it might help people actually think again about privacy and rediscover it. The more we learn about the power of government intelligence agencies to intrude on communications, the more we learn about the connections between government intelligence agencies and private sector telecommunications service providers, the more we're encouraged to think again about how much information we put out there. And, and without, you know, curiously, without all of that debate going on, that anxious debate about powers and potential abuses on the part of intelligence agencies, I, I suspect we might have really tipped ourselves over the edge in terms of never uh, again uh, having any kind of uh, coherent definition of privacy. I think the security debate might push us back into a sphere where, again, once again, we value privacy and do more to protect it. Jamil, can I get you on that? Because clearly this generation doesn't care nearly as much about privacy, if at all, as, say, mine or our parents or whatever. Would you agree? 
Um, you know, I'm not sure it's that that simple. I, I think that people, it's true that people do share a lot of information now on Facebook or Twitter uh, that they wouldn't even have dreamt of sharing 20 years ago or 40 years ago had those platforms been available. Uh, but, but I think that people still care a lot about controlling what they share and who gets to see it. Uh, and, and, and I think that the reaction to the Snowden revelations shows you that there, there really still is uh, a sense, uh, a widely shared sense, that there ought to be limits to what the government can, uh, can intrude on without good justification. Um, I think part of the problem, at least here in the United States, is that, is that the law hasn't kept up with these technological changes. And there is this legal doctrine in the United States that holds that when you share information with a third party, you lose your constitutionally protected privacy interest in it. So for example, if you give information to one person or to Facebook or to Twitter, uh, then you can no longer complain when that information is accessed by the government. Uh, but the truth is that now there's very little you can do in the world without sharing information with some third party. Your doctor has your medical records, your school has your educational records. Uh, if you want to communicate with somebody by email, your internet service provider ha has, your, has your emails. And so uh, that doctrine, that third party records doctrine, has turned out to be uh, uh, something that's really getting in the way of our laws uh, uh, evolving to reflect the way that we, we now use new technology. So um, I, guess, I guess what I'd say is, you know, you're right, obviously, that people are, um, people are, are interacting in ways that they didn't 20 years ago, and that involves the sharing of information that they might not have shared uh, in a previous generation. But I'm not sure that's a sign that they don't care about privacy. I think that people just have a more complicated relationship to privacy than they did uh, in previous generations. And Ron, in our last minute here, if you had to make a bet on whether or not the NSA is spying on the ACLU in the United States, how much would you bet on that happening? Oh, I, 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 we have to assume they are because they're collecting everyone's information as we started out. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the basis of uh, a lawsuit that the ACLU is launching because, of course, many of their uh, attorney-client privileges are being uh, violated by the fact that the NSA is collecting all of this information. Not the technical, like, not, not the actual conversations that they're having, but well, the metadata. Know, I think that's still an open question, frankly. I mean, we do know about the metadata programs, uh, but it relates to an earlier part of the conversation. I think there's been a a misuse of the language in terms of how the officials responsible for these programs have explained it to Congress. Uh, frankly, uh, in my opinion, outright deception uh, by DNI Director James Clapper when he was asked directly, are you collecting information on Americans wholesale? And he said no. I mean, this, we, we have to take that into account with respect to uh, some of the topics that we talked about earlier. Gotcha. I want to thank all four of you for contributing to our conversation tonight here on TVO. In New York, New York, Jamil Jaffer from the American Civil Liberties Union. In Washington, D.C., Joshua Faust, formerly of the American Security Project. In Ottawa, Wesley Wark from the University of Ottawa. And here in our studios in Toronto, Ron Diebert from the Citizens Lab at uh, U of T's Monk School. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Thanks. You. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.